I'm Paul Parisi, from, and I have a church that's called Grace Bible Fellowship from Batavia. Uh, I have a TV program called uh, Fellowship Brown Hill Book Club. I'm a good personal friend of Richard's, and he's asked me to come up and do some stuff before, and I could never make it up here and do it. So this year he asked me to do a seminar, and it's on uh, Why Prayer Doesn't Save You in Romans 10, which is the most difficult passage of Scripture to deal with. First of all, people ask many times, why is Romans 9, 10, 11? When you read the book of Romans, I don't know how wide, you know, how much you read, but you read the book of Romans, it's dealing with the issue of justification. It's dealing with God's righteousness, Christ's righteousness, and the faith of Christ. And, and what happens is people think by putting Romans 9, 10, and 11 in there, it disrupts that kind of thinking process. And it does, it falls right into place. Romans 10 is dealing with the issue of justification. But here's the complication. If you turn to Romans chapter 10, I hope I can do it. And you, you know, if you have questions, you're, you're, you're welcome to ask them. Yesterday you got a little bizarre over prayer. I'm not teaching prayer per se is after you're saved, does it has God into your prayers and anything. I'm talking about prayer as far as if a person being saved, if you don't mind me using it for an example, if he's and I'm talking to him about the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not gonna have him repeat a prayer after me like I got saved. I got saved in the Baptist church. I truly got saved. I thank God for that, okay? April 27th, 1975, 10.45 in the morning, I accepted Christ. And they used the Romans road. This is a very normal thing to use. It's called the Roman road. Okay? So, wrong one. So, it, it, and what happens to people is, they see this contact with tracks going out. Romans road, you can use, you can confess your sins, you can do this. Hi. Come on in. We should have closed the door, so that's all right. No, no, go ahead. So uh, hopefully you understand. I have to bring you to understanding the context where we are. You just have, you, you, it's a difficult subject as it is. You go into Romans chapter 10, verse 9 to 13. Paul's using Old Testament illustrations out of the book of Deuteronomy. He's using Leviticus. He takes Joel 2, 20, 32, which is a tribulational passage in Joel. Is that something you Okay, thank you, sir. Just introduction anyways, okay? Oh, okay, Thank So, it, it, it's, it's a passage where does Paul violate the gospel of the grace of God because he's using these structures of test, Old Testament and he's using Joel 2.32. Is he violating this? No, he's not violating the gospel of the grace of God. He's, he's given divine inspiration. He was got the okay to write these things in the way he's presented it. Now, I don't have a, a board per se as far as... Uh, hi, brother. Good to see you. I, I, I don't have a board to show you this, so it's going to be hard to describe, but bear with me. Is this on the King James? No. Where's that one? Prayer. I have no idea. Oh, I'm just run next door. Yeah. So uh, you have to understand the perspective. In from Acts 1 to 7, is that somebody there you want to close that? Okay. From Acts 1 to 7, you have nationalism. If you can just follow me here. I don't have a, yesterday I had a board so I could draw it out and I get the picture. You have nationalism. What I mean by the nation of Israel had their one one year of trial, except Christ, except the Holy Ghost, and they rejected it. Okay? So what happens after that is it becomes individualism. It becomes personalism. And Paul comes on the scene, he's given the gospel of the grace of God. Okay? And now he became the chief, actually he was the chief prime, uh, candidate for the prime candidate for the Antichrist because of what he was doing in his heart, but he was sincere. So he gets saved, now it becomes individual and personal, and Peter doesn't realize that. Peter's just going right along, doing what the commission taught him, go to the Jew, nationally, scattered abroad, go to the Gentiles. These are things Peter was, was, Gentile salvation is a reality, it comes all the way back, okay? So when I start to read to you, I'm going to try to give you a, a, a catch up where we are in chapter 10, and why is Paul addressing them according to the flesh? I don't know if you've ever seen that. So if you look at chapter 9 for a moment, and if you have questions on that, what, and let me stress one thing for it uh, again. We're dealing with prayer as far as can prayer save you. Okay? We're dealing, do you have to confess the Lord Jesus? We're dealing with these issues, not prayer afterwards, as far as when you pray, like in Philippians 4, Colossians 4. We're not dealing with that. We're dealing with, if somebody wants to come to Christ, what do you have to help them do so they can be saved? To me, by faith, strictly alone. You can do nothing. You can, 
you can say all the prayers you want with them. You can tell them to confess what they need to confess, and it has nothing to do with their heart. Okay? What I've always learned, and I, 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 I love visitation. I went out. I love door knocking. Okay? Uh, where I live in the country, they, the soliciting thing got stopped. So I can't go out as much as I used to. And I tell them, if you believe in your heart, if you trust the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, remember this, 1 Corinthians 15, going through this, Paul's gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. The other understanding of blood. There has never been a Paul prayer. No, 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 no. Hear me out here, because there was some guy confused over this. Paul never asked you to help somebody get saved by prayer. Let me say it this way. Okay? Paul taught prayer, but in Romans 8, he says, you don't know what to pray for. You remember that verse right there? And one of the reasons why is because he didn't have the completed revelation. Once they had the completed revelation, they understood how to pray. Israel knew what to pray for. They had kingdom prayer. So here's Paul using the, this issue of the kingdom to get an, uh, Israel individually. Now it's a little flock. Now it's the remnant. And he's trying to reach these people, and he's using illustrations of Old Testament. Again, I'm going to repeat some things. It, it helps you understand where we are. So look at Romans 9 just for a moment, okay? Verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bear uh, me witness in the Holy Ghost, for that I have great heaviness and continuous sorrow in my heart. The word sorrow starts off this whole context. Chapter 9, 10, and 11. He rejoices in chapter 11, but starts off, Paul had great sorrow because he loved his nation. Matter of fact, hold your hand there. Turn over to Acts 23. Acts 23. And again, this is dealing with the issue of prayer, but I wanted to bring you to the uh, little background on what Paul was dealing with here and how he addresses them. And chapter 23, if you look at verse 6 with me, please. And he says, But when Paul perceived that the one part of Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope, now here's the key, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called to question. I think about that for a moment. Here's Paul going along in 60 AD. He's got the revelation of the gospel, but he's still addressing Israel. Romans 9, 10, and 11, he's going to be addressing Israel according to the flesh. Now he's going to reach those Jews so they can understand justification, Romans 10, past, an issue of what was in the past, what was in the future in 11. God has not cast away Israel. I know I know God's going to promise. These are the things that are going to help you understand why Paul used what he did. And he, and he remember now, confession started back in Levit Leviticus uh, chapter 5. Excuse me, my mouth's getting dry already. Leviticus chapter 5, the word confession is the first time mentioned. It goes all the way through. And you have to remember now, when Christ comes along, there was a message that Peter was receiving. You remember the keys to the kingdom, that issue of the keys to the kingdom that Peter had? That was the gospel. The gospel pertaining that to the kingdom, as far as Peter's commission was, to go out to the nations where they were scattered and tell them and preach to them that he is the Christ and he is the Son of God. That's the message that Paul got saved on. He accepted him as the Son of God and he was the Christ. That was the message as far as the Messiah is concerned. Now this is all this confusion going on in this era of time in maybe 35 years. Paul comes along and starts to get revelation now and God has seen his burden. He says, I want you to go to this little flock or a remnant that's out there, not the little flock, excuse me, that's the wrong terminology, and, and, and give them the gospel, but use what you need to use to, for them to understand. They're not going to understand Greek, but they're going to understand Hebrew. See? And this is what Paul's doing. So turn to me, if you want to, uh, uh, just for sake of time, and let me, let me do this here. Uh, turn over to 26, or chapter 26. I might even go to 28. Because we have so much to talk about. Yeah, why don't we just go over to 28? And it'll be a lot less of time here. I've got 55 minutes to try to explain this. Now, you have to remember in verse 20, there's another incident where Paul gives his testimony about what he's doing. Now, remember, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. He's now, this has caused a lot of confusion with a lot of people. He's, he's the apostle to the Gentiles, and now all of a sudden, uh, I tell hello. How are you? Nice. 
I'm sorry. They're fine. And now, uh, you know, he's the foster to the Gentiles. You have to remember one thing. I wish I had a board that right now the national status of Israel is not being recognized by God. As far as God is concerned, they are nothing than part of the nations. God does have no, no more apple in their eye for Israel. They're not the channel blessing to the Gentiles. They're not the instrument of spirituality going to God. The Gentiles had to go through Israel to God. This is not happening. It's all done after Acts 7. Paul comes along and tries to show them personally, individually, you've got to accept Christ. And the way you need to accept Christ is you need to understand prayer doesn't save you. Confession, as far as who he is, in Romans 10, I'm going to go there. And this is where he's at right now. Okay, Now it's uh, 63 AD. And listen to what Paul's saying in 63 AD, verse 20. For this cause, therefore, I, I have called for you to see you and to speak with you. Because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this trait. You see? For the hope of Israel. Well, if you go to chapter 3 of Ephesians, who, who is he a prisoner of? For the Gentiles. So right now, God's allowing Israel to realize that this chain that Paul has is not because they're separated in their priority. They are nothing more than part of the nations. And Paul said, I am shackled there. You know why? Turn over to 11.5. Go back to Romans. Go to, turn to 11, chapter 11, verse 5 for a moment. And uh, this, this kind of like concludes it for you. And then we'll go to chapter 10 and hopefully you can uh, settle some issues about it if you have any questions. Verse 5. Even so at this present time also there's a remnant according to the election of grace. This is 60 AD. Yet Paul turned around and says, I am both in question about the resurrection of Israel. The, the word Israel could be confusing because it's not national in Romans 9, 10, and 11. You're dealing with a remnant. You're dealing with individuals. In 11, he starts to explore all Israel would be saved nationally. He goes back to it. But Romans 9 and 10, he's not. He's showing in chapter 9 of Romans, he's showing the history, the inheritance of Israel. In chapter 10, he's telling them justification by faith. No, they didn't understand that kind of language. Okay? So he says in verse 7, What then? Israel has to pay that which it seeketh for? But the election, the remnant in verse 5, uh, has obtained it, and the rest were what? Blessed. So this issue, if you, if you go back to chapter 9 for a moment, that we're dealing with, if you look at um, well, verse 3 of chapter 9, it helps us understand it more clear, and then we'll get to 10, and we'll start asking you ask some questions if you'd like. Verse 3, I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brother and my kinsmen according to the flesh. So what Paul is stating here is, these brethren that I'm talking about are kinsmen according to the flesh. This all has to do with, how is Paul going to present this gospel of justification by faith? You now have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You need to confess Christ. And how is he going to do that? Even though he had sorrow, he had love for the nation, he addressed them as the flesh. Now you know we're not a part of the flesh, we're part of the spirit. See, Philippians 3.3 3 teaches to that. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and not in the flesh. See? But Paul needs to reach these people because God saw there was a remnant that desired to know the truth. And it's now justification. These remnant realize that nation is no more than a nation as far as God's concerned. And that's disturbing. It's disturbing to Paul as well. Look at verse, uh, uh, verse 5 for a moment. And he says, Who are... Whose are the fathers, and whom are is concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. You see why Christ came? Now why would Paul, after being, well he got saved approximately 34 AD, approximately, it is now 60 AD, 26 years later, still saying those things, why Christ came in the flesh, Second Corinthians is now written, Romans is the last epistle in the Acts prayer written, Answering the questions of Galatia, asking the questions at Corinth, and Paul's writing the book of Romans to answer these questions. And here he's turning around talking about the flesh, see? Because God knew there's still an election according to grace and wants to get saved. The answer to that is, look over to chapter 11. And I think we're pretty much sufficient for what I'm trying to get across to you, and then we'll go into the context. Chapter 11, and uh, 
just look at verse 32 with me, okay? For God had concluded them all in unbelief. Now, I want you to remember the word all, okay? That's very important. Because when we get to chapter 10, he starts to talk about no difference. And in the, na the nation Israel's history, there's always been a, dis a, a difference. The distinction was very clear. No Gentile could go around the Jewish temple, and no Jew would ever sit down with a Gentile and eat. There always was a distinction. But now he's saying there's no difference. So he says in verse uh, 11, verse 32, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he, what now, he might have mercy upon all. You see that right there? Turn back over to chapter 10. Chapter 10. And, uh, and we'll look at verse... Uh, uh, look at verse 4. We'll look at verse 4. Well, no, no, I'm sorry, look at verse 11. Verse 11 would be the key. For the scripture saith that whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. Paul's quoting Old Testament. The cry out, you want to get saved? Whosoever. Watch what he says in verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew. When Paul says that in verse 22, I want you to realize there was a issue started in chapter 3. If you want to just take, don't take my word on it, write it down, look at verse the first here. He goes back and settles the issue about the Jew first. He goes back and shows that justification is declared today. In order for you to be saved, it's by grace and through faith. Okay? And it's not the issue of him not resurrected. Look what he says here in verse uh, uh, 12 again. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. You see that? Romans 11. The mercy is being extended out to whosoever. He has now made the Jew equal with the Gentile. And this is the hardest thing for people to grasp. It really is. If you know anything about the... I study... Uh, I do it for a living. I did it for 30 years. And my whole library is nothing but Greek. I love reading Jewish history. I'm a historian. To me, the Book of Romans is a historical book. It goes all the way back to Adam, Moses. It goes back to a Adam, Abraham, Moses. It goes back through the prophets and, and all this kind of stuff. And I love that kind of stuff. But never before God for 2,000 years ever equalized the Jew and the Gentile. Now it's happened. And now that Paul's going to say, I, I need to see these people come to Christ. And I know people want to come to Christ, but it has to be on their terms, in their language. It can't be in Greek. So he's going to use things that he wouldn't use for a Gentile. I don't know how anybody got saved in this room. I, don't, I know Jim personally. I know Paul. We go back years at conferences. I know one thing for sure. I'll tell you and confess to you. I can confess now. That I got saved by the Romans rule. Okay? I didn't know any better. I went to a Baptist church. I wanted to get saved. They said, listen, if you confess the Lord Jesus in your heart, and this, I got saved April 27, 1975, 1045 in the morning. I remember it like it was yesterday. Is that right? No. That is not correct. I don't have to say anything. I just have to believe. It's in your heart. So for me to say a prayer to get saved is in, incorrect. Did I know any better? No. Did Apostle Paul know any better? No. He went out persecuting. God didn't help that to him. He just says, I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Paul said, I didn't know all I was defending the God that I worship and serve. I was defending my nation. And these people were violating what the law said. And God did say this one person that I believed that he could have been the prime candidate for the Antichrist. He was raking havoc on these people. So the context that Richard want me to present is to say a prayer doesn't save you today. Confessing Jesus Christ as your Savior doesn't save you today. What saves you today is faith, justification, and how you're declared righteous as Abraham was in uncircumcision, Romans chapter 4. I only got 55 minutes. He got saved by faith, and it was imputed, accounted, and reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. It's by faith. You know, some people say, "What? Well, you know, my wife is wonderful. She's my worst critic. 47 years, 48 years now we've been together. And she goes, Paul, it's just too simple. And I said, you hit it right on the nose. And it's so simple. And I keep telling you, I says, she goes, but when I talk to people, don't you want them to say something? I said, that's humanism. That's works. You don't have to say nothing. You know, when somebody gets saved, and they truly believe in their heart, I believe if you have faith, he'll come in to save you with his faith. If you have faith and belief in your heart, 
A prayer won't do any for anything for you. A prayer actually distorts the reality of salvation. And allow me to look. I'm getting odd. If you don't mind, I got to take this thing off. I don't wear one at home. I have a nice shirt. I don't even wear a tie, so I'm doing it for the benefit of these. Uh, there was a couple that uh, I, I I'm a door knock. I love door knocking. I love talking to people about Christ. And I went door knocking, and this guy came to our church. He said, "My wife's saved." but she don't want to come. I said, well, can I come over and visit her? You know, I'm, the first person, people I had were my three little children, my wife in the park, and I started the ministry 27 years ago, going on 28. So he goes, sure. So I went over there, long story short, and I says to, uh, here she's sitting here, and I smelled the cigarettes all over. Okay? She's sitting here, he's sitting there in a rocking chair like this. And I says, Gene, I'm Paul Parisi, I'm starting a church. It's a grace church, it's a dispensational church. I says, uh, if you die today, right out of the clear blue sky, I'd like to do that. And would you die? Would you have your trip life? She just said that. He goes, I told you she was saved. I said, I understand what you said. I said, you, you mind if I, and I didn't want any truth. This is their house. I want to be polite, graceful. I said, but can I ask your wife that question? He goes, uh, and I said, Gene, and he goes, I told you she was saved. So I thought it out. And I says, okay. And then she looked at him and she said, Gordy, I am not saved. And they, they, uh, it was Calvary Baptist Church. Brought her in a room, just a little bit to have rooms when you want to get saved. They brought her in a room. They says, here's what you need to believe. Now think about this message. I'm going to bring you to it, hopefully, before I conclude. If you believe he's the Christ, and he's the Son of God, and life is in his name, you can be saved. You know what that is? That's lordship and salvation. That's easy believism. And she says, that's all I have to do? That's exactly her words. I'm not quoting her anything in my word. She says, yes, that is... That is that's all I got to do? He goes, yes, that's all you have to do. She did it. So he walks out, praising God, put a notch on his belt. That's what the Baptists do. I was a Baptist for two years. And they went in the auditorium rejoicing she got saved. She walked out and going to hell. Okay? So when I talked to her about it, I said, Gene, could I get a guess why you didn't get saved? She goes, absolutely. And Gordy's now the wife ran the family, so he just <laughs> shut right up. And she goes, I says, why don't you go light a cigarette? <laughs> you know, I smoke. I felt like saying, you, you, can't, you, you can't open no one. I said, why don't you go light a cigarette and let's talk about the Lord. I said, you think cigarettes kept you from understanding the gospel of the grace of God? She goes, it, absolutely it did. My works of drinking beer and drink and having a cigarette, how can God see me declared or, or accept me? That's the word she used. I said, God accept you as a sinner. Yeah. We were his enemies. We were ungodly. And she goes, what do I have to do? I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. She goes, what do I have to say? I said, nothing. Just believe it in your heart. And she got saved that day, 25 years she's been in her ministry, and she knows more grace than I do. Because she got saved that way. So when you start to say, I need to say a prayer with you, you're adding humanism. Lordship salvation. And you want to concur, you are the one that's the judge of saying that she got saved. See? Why don't we let the person by the fruit of their lips, tell me they're saved. See, when I hear a Christian in battle with the flesh, I listen to him. Because, number one, if somebody's battling something in the flesh, that tells me he's saved. If he's got conviction about what he's living like and what he's doing, that what could convict him? He wasn't, he wasn't convicted before he was saved, so that gives me a light saying, hey, this guy's saved, but he's just having little trials. See? And some people think we're so self-righteous, we're not like those people that like still smoking cigarettes and drinking beer and all this other stuff. We're just like them. We were enemies. We're ungodly. He, no, he didn't just save the ungodly and his enemies. He saved the ones that thought they were righteous in Romans 5. Okay? So let's look at Romans 10 for a moment and, and try to get the context. And what I want to do is go back and show you that one message that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the Christ and the Son of God. That is a kingdom message. Those were the keys that Peter had. Peter was commissioned to go out and tell the nation that the Messiah is here. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And based upon that, I can tell you eternally, spiritually, that he is the Redeemer. And that was the nation's big thing. They did not want to accept him as the Christ. And you go to 1 John, and by the way, I, never, I don't get there. If you ever want to take a little study, the doctrine of Christ, the terminology of the doctrine of Christ, is found in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Okay? That's what it says. 
And the only time the Antichrist is mentioned in the entire Bible is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Isn't that a coincidence? Here's the doctrine of Christ, saying that he is the Christ, he is the Son of God, and the only time the Antichrist is mentioned is in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now why is that? Because he's opposed, and that this Christ that came, you're saying he is the Christ, is not the Christ, I'm the Christ. That's 1st, 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2. So, when we get into context of chapter 10, and you see, this can be says in verse 1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. So it starts to make sense to you now. I give a little history, very, very vividly, and I wish I had more time. I could really draw this out for you, but I don't have that liberty. So I'll try to condense, and condense this message, hopefully, basically enough you can understand what we're dealing with, okay? Now this desire, for I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not a foreign knowledge. The zeal is religion. You know, religion always tells you you can't do that, but you do this. And if you do this, you can't do that. It, it's consolidating down. You become really religious bigots. And they're hating the Apostle Paul because he, he, they felt he was a traitor, got saved, and now he's preaching the faith he once destroyed, Galatians 1. And now he's got the audacity to bring Romans 9, 10, and 11 into a book of justification. It has every right to be there. Now, I want you to realize this. Not for, my, not for me, but for yourself. Go to the book of Romans and show me where prayer is in the book of Romans. And the only thing you have in Romans 8 is the prayer that we don't know what to pray for. And I explained earlier, that prayer was said, that was said in a statement because we didn't have complete revelation yet. Paul didn't have visions, Colossians, and all of them. Once they got complete revelation... You know what? We start to understand what prayer works like. Because now we got the complete revelation. It's progressive. Progressive revelation helps everything. So now if you go down through to the text that we're going to deal with, uh, you look at verse 9, and Paul approaches them this way. Religion approaches this way. If you want to get saved, brother, sure. Why don't you say a prayer with me? Confess it. And I'm going to show you these verses where you can do that. And I try to show you the best that I could the foundation of what these are built on. They're not built on for believers today. They're not built on that at all. And uh, remember this, he does not, this does not violate the gospel of the grace of God. You have to remember now what we're going to be reading is not opposed, and Paul's not contradicting himself. He has to talk, the, the, the Jews require a Hebrew language. He's not talking Greek. He's not. He sees a remnant there, so he wants to deal with them. Here's how he's going to deal with them. In chapter 10, verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and by the way, your translations, you know what? Put Jesus as Lord. Do you know why? By putting Jesus as Lord in the new translation, that makes him lordship over your salvation. You know, lordship, it's not a bad thing. But what has to happen is you need to come to Christ first. Let me just show you a principle. Turn over to Romans 6 for a moment. Hold your hand there. Turn over to Romans 6. Real quick, like, and then I'm going to ask you if you have any questions. I'm going to read down through the verse. And in verse 11, this is, this is, do you ever hear the term, I gave my heart to Jesus? Oh, yeah. Did you ever hear that term? I gave my offering to Jesus, to God. It's always to God, to God, to God. You ever hear that? My heart to God. It's God. I, I, you know, I'm at work, and I only work two days a week. I'm semi retired. And the people know who I am. They used to call me the preacher in the company. Everybody knew me. There was 30 stores. They all knew me. And one of the things they always brought up was the issue of God. But I never heard Jesus Christ. See, there's a misconception. Satan knows how to do it so slick. And he knows how to do it so deceitfully that he'll get you to mention God, 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 and he forgets about the person that you have to go to to go to God. See, this is how he gets Christianity. They make him believe that God's doing this. Well, what happened to the headship of Christ? What happened to Christ's righteousness now working in you? So Paul's going to start explaining that to the Jews. You love God, so do I. I serve my fathers. I serve God based on... But you have to realize there's another common denominator. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I accepted him. And now we need to accept him as our Savior in order to get to God. Now listen to these two verses. Verse 11. Likewise, reckon your, uh, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. And that's where they stop. See? Well, what does the rest of that verse say? It says, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
says one meter between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And he leaves that out. Look at look at what he says down in verse 13. Neither yield your your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but you yourselves unto God as those that are alive uh, from the dead, and your instruments as instru instruments of righteousness unto God. Well, that's Jesus Christ. Once you understand by faith, not by prayer, not by confession, we're going to be reading. By prayer, you accept Christ as your personal Savior. Jesus Christ's righteousness, which is the righteousness of God, is imputed to you. It's called imputed, counted, and reckoned. Romans 6. Okay? That those three terms are in Romans 6. That happens you had a performance system that was supernatural. I'm not charismatic in any sense of the way. But how can you explain the Holy Spirit dividing your spirit soul body? How do you, how do you explain that? See? If it wasn't supernatural, who could do something like that? I have I have cancer. I have leukemia. And I spent five months in a hospital. There's nothing they could do for my spirit, soul, and body. But when God comes into it, in fact, who delivers us from the power of darkness and translate us into the kingdom of sun, there had to be a performance system that was done. And that performance system was done through the operation of the Spirit of God circumcising you. Circumcision made without hands. And when you hear Israel's program, it's made with hands. Now it's made without hands. You know the heavens were made without hands? Now think about this for a minute. If you're made without hands, and the heavens are made without hands, where's your glory? Where are you going to be in the future? Do you think God didn't know what he was doing before the foundation of the world? You know, people quote, quote this verse a lot. Listen to this one. By grace you're saved through faith, not of yourself, to give to God, not of works, as any man should call. True? True. But they forget verse 10. For we are his workmanship created on good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. Good works were added. But they were given to us, and this is what Israel had a hard time with in chapter 10. Good works were given to us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians 1 6, He that begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. He that hath begun a good work in you. Titus 3 is the exact same illustration. Folks, anything we do after we're saved, it's His good work in us. We, we can't. We, you think you can really perform anything good? Oh, jeez, I apologize. My wife, she's like a man of me. She's going to North Carolina to visit my daughter this time, tape. And, uh, and uh, she's worried about me. So I'll give her a call back. Okay. You know, it seems like the pattern. Richard had a phone call on the phone. Uh, who was it for yesterday? I don't know who it was. But my wife's going to North Carolina to visit my one daughter. And then she's going to Denver flying to visit my other daughter. She's getting married in order to hit me. She won't let me do it. She told me I'm too long-winded. So. But anyways, uh, we have to get back to reality here. So this is where we're at. So what you have here is this. In Romans chapter 10, go back to Romans chapter 10. And listen to this context we're dealing with. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and, and shalt believe in thy heart God that raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see the word raised there and the word saved? Isn't that a partial understanding of what Paul was preaching about the death, burial, and resurrection? You ever notice what he says in uh, 2 Timothy 2 8? He says, Remember that Jesus Christ is of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. He didn't say he died, buried, and raised there. He told Timothy that. Timothy was an understanding Jew. He said, You remember where he came from. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. But you accepted him by the death, burial, and resurrection. And your justification is not built on the law. It's not built on the Old Testament. It's built on Jesus Christ. She'll say she's sorry I'll be mad at her. I can't be mad at her. 40 or 7 years, how can you be mad at something like her? I'm sorry. My deepest apologies. Okay, go to verse 11. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth in him should not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord uh, over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now here's a discrepancy I wish I had about an hour to talk about. Doesn't he, doesn't he quote Joel 2.32? If you know your Bible, doesn't he not quote, quote that? There was a big confusion in this yesterday. Who would give Paul permission to do that? It was God. Why would he quote 232 here? 
Why would he say there's no difference in verse four, in, in, in 3.22? And why is he saying there's no difference here? And then he quotes, Whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You think Paul would be violating his message of grace, but he's not. He's, he's, he's reaching the Jews. He's reaching people that understand Old Testament scripture. Here's the confusing part. What does Peter quote at Pentecost? Same verse. Why? Because Joel 2.32 says the end's coming. It's coming. Call upon the Lord. End of trip. Jacob's troubles, three and a half years. It's finally coming. You go back to Joel. I don't have a lot of time to. If you read the context in Joel, that verse right there is the end of all the disaster that's going to happen in the Great Tribulation. Jacob's trouble. It's only three and a half years. I know we say seven years is tribulation. It's actually three and a half years. Okay? That's going to be the thrust of all the things that's going to happen since the world never seen. Okay? But Paul has every right to say that. Now here's why. And if you have any questions, you can start asking. Okay? There's a lot. I have four pages of notes we're not going to get to. I'll blame that on my wife. Okay? But, <laughs> but what you got to understand is the nation in Israel is now set aside. Paul has every liberty to use whatever he wants to use, and God gave him the go away. He said to do that. Let's look at verse 8 for a minute. Here's the reason why Paul can use that. Verse 9 and 10 go back to verse 8, because verse 8 is going to explain this issue that Paul's talking about, verse 8. He says, uh, But what saith, uh, what saith it? The word is thy thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You know what he's talking about? He's talking around Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse 11 to 14, if you want to go there. 11 to 14, write it down. You find that Paul's using that illustration. But what he does here, he flip-flops some words. He takes the Old Testament illustration, he adds the word Christ to it. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying in verse um, 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. He starts to add to things that Deuteronomy wrote. And he's going to explain to them that those uh, uh, verses back there were uh, given forth to a Messiah, was given forth to the person of Jesus Christ. Now the mystery of Christ has been revealed. Now you guys can believe. How are you going to believe? By confessing it. Now, confessing, you got to realize, it's not a, it, it, it's an agreement with, okay? It's an aval. You, you, you don't have to spit it out to agree with it. You just agree with it. The Jew needed to understand that the Old Testament verse that he was using, what was added was the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Paul was preaching, and by his resurrection, they can have eternal life by how? Faith. Okay? Now here's the problem. People try to use this today by witnessing the people. Now how do you explain all that to a person that's unsaved? The context of Romans 9, 10, 11, which is the most difficult Romans 9, 10, and 11 is the most difficult section in Paul's writing. Do you know that there's one verse to me that I believe that Paul's heart was destroyed when in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20, when he finally realized that the law is no, no longer under him. He's not under the law no more. He's not obligated to him. That ship wrecked him. 2,000 years of generation. Could you imagine if he had a family for 2,000 years? And all your family ever heard was the law, what God required under the law. It was not grace. It was under the law. How would you feel all of a sudden that you have to release something of heritage for 2,000 years? And remember, he was schooled under Gamaliel. Paul could have been a Gamaliel. He was the next candidate for all that stuff. And yet, he told me, he said, the sorrow I have for Israel, not just Israel, and all my countrymen according to the flesh. But he did what God wanted him to do. He was the apostle, Roman, Romans 11, 13, to the Gentiles. I magnify my office. I have changed my citizenship. I am now in heaven. Uh, it, 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 let me ask uh, if you have any questions. Let me say this to you. When you got saved, where were you resurrected to? In your standing, okay? We, we know you're here geographically, all right? You're, you're raised to heaven. In Colossians 3, set your affections on things above, not on things on here. Verse 1. Well, what is he talking about? Affection. That's the mind. So we are to set our minds up there. As a matter of fact, turn over to Colossians just for a moment. <clears throat> chapter 3. This is an interesting verse. It, it parallels chapter 2 of Ephesians. But I'm not going to turn to Ephesians again for the sake of time. In Colossians chapter 3, 
And this is where we are in our standing now, okay? This is where we are in our position. Verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Seek those things which are above. Set your affections on things above, not on the things of the earth. So when you got saved, something happened to you, according to Ephesians 2. You were resurrected by believing, not by confessing, not by works. You just believed, and immediately you went. Okay? Listen to what he says here, though. In verse uh, 3. For you are dead, and your life is hid is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall also appear with him. You notice verse 3 says, your life, he says, your life is hid with Christ in God. Do you know that Christ and we together are hid in God? Yes. Think about that for a second. That's how privileged you are to have all spiritual blessings. Do you know that you have every right to anything in the universe? That's our destiny. That's our home. We're made without hands. The heavens made up. So the thrones that our brother talked about this morning, and it, it just touched my heart. I study that all the time. In the back of my Bible, I have charts talking about the thrones, the principalities, the powers, the mights, the dominions. Those are our dominionship. Those are our reignship. You think the verse, i got to ask you a question. You think the verse to the intent now, I like the word intent. He opens chapter 3 with the cause. Verse 14, the cause. For what's cause? What's cause? Then he goes to the intent now unto the principalities and powers of heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And the word manifold is all accumulated wisdom. And that tells me that the seat in heaven where we're going to be is going to be a different language. We're going to have different wisdom. And it's all because of his graciousness. I had put that in there. I love that part, part of it because this is what I've been focusing for. Uh, Jim knows my past, my family. We've suffered many things as a family. And I'm not a martyr by any sense of the means. And recently, I just told you what happened to me. Um, my wife's ill. You know, and those are part of natural consequences that happen in life. But we are not quitting. We're not about to quit. We're so <coughs> close to glory. Why would you quit? Think about this for a minute. Without getting into the world society today, is there anything you can turn on on TV and be decent? Just looking at that aspect, can you turn on the news and hear something you wanted to hear? The whole world is in chaos. And I'm not predicting, I'm not a prophet. I don't know when he's coming. I do know it's a mystery. And I know with a twinkle in an eye, we're going to be gone. We were talking about that in the room. And uh, I asked the guys, there were three of us, you know, at, uh, they were in there doing seminars. I asked them, and we got talking about that. I said, what's going to happen to our flesh and blood? How's that going to work? You know? And you're gone with a twink of an eye. Did you notice in that verse what it says? That verse says, verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then, then, when, at that time, shall you also appear with him in glory. That means when he appears, he comes out of hid, being hid from God. At the immediate time he does that, we're there with him. That's what it said. Isn't that enough to rejuvenate you a little bit to get excited about his word and who he is and how he lives in you. So if, if, if I can help you in any way with questions and why prayer doesn't save you, I think you folks pretty much know that when you walked in. So I just explored some other, other avenues with you, okay, which I feel it's a blessing. Turn over to chapter 2 for a moment. Just for a moment, I want to explain something to us about our... We were delivered from the power of darkness and translated into our, the kingdom of his dear son, his beloved son, in whom, verse 11, he also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in the putting off of the body of sins by the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, or in also risen, Romans 6. Great job this morning on that. Through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead, and we went with him. We not only raised with him when we believe, we're going to raise with him when he gets out of being hid, we're going to raise with him there. You know you have a future redemption. You did not get all your redemption at Calvary. Are you aware of that? You have a future redemption. I don't know how much you love your body. I don't know how much you look in the mirror. But when I look in the mirror, I kind of get disgusted, you know. So I'm also looking for a mirror job. I'm under a new one, crisis image. But think about this for a second. You say, what do you mean about a future redemption? You ever notice what he says? You're stamped and sealed until the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. 
of God, chapter 4, verse 3 of Ephesians, whereby you are sealed until the until. day of redemption. Until. Until, I'm sorry. Thank you, Jim. Got Jim here for that purpose. And, and what you got here is we had a redemption that's glorious. Comes along the theme of Ephesians, all spiritual blessings. And he starts to explore those uh, 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 spiritual blessings through the book of Ephesians like a chest. Like it was just gold and emerald and choice things for us. Not one of us deserved all spiritual blessings, did we? Think about that for a minute. Aren't you glad to go to a Grace Church or a Grace Conference and hear the truth? You might get bored with this kind of stuff, but I get excited about this stuff. And you know what? I know some of you do too. It's a reality. Once you start, I had the most it's going to be strange. I did not want to go home from the hospital. I had such a grand time at Roswell Hospital. Uh, it's a cancer ward. It's all it does to deal with cancer. By the time I was done, the infusion center, the nurses, the nurse practitioner, the doctors all called me a preacher. It's all the same. Not most. I, I had my pity parties. You know, light went off the first night, and I'm going, what's going to happen? You know, you, you, you always hear the bad news about this. Uh, you know what I did? I just took what was at home in my life that Christ gave me, and I put it there. I brought my tools, Richard's tape on James, and I start reading, studying, and people come in and say, I want to talk about your soundness of mind, psychologist. I invite him in the room. After an hour, she hands me a card for her and her boyfriend to get prayer for her. That's how it was the whole trip. You know what, though? Attitude and faith beats up. I'm telling you right now, guys, when, when everything is down, the world starts to appear to you, and you start to get down to yourself. Remember the attitude that Christ has given you through his righteousness. Remember the attitude he gives you in your faith. It's faith is the one that strengthens our faith to get through the descent. It's not confessing anything. I mean, I told you my testimony, but I didn't confess it. I got, I got saved that way, but in my heart, what I really got saved by, by accepting the death, the burial, resurrection. So is there any questions on that or any questions you want to add? If not, you must be hot and tired in here. I see everybody's eyes sleeping. I have a, I have a, a small fellowship. I mean, we went from 50. We're down in the small. And uh, these people are, are uh, fanatics. In a way, it's kind of bad because it doesn't end after 45 minutes. The questions start after 45 minutes. There's times we're there for two and a half hours on Sunday. And it's great. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, 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 I could shoot from the hip. I haven't used a note yet. Okay? And I don't know why you make notes. They ask me all the time, Richard, why, why do you even make notes? Richard's like that. You know why? Because you get the love for it. And you see the reality of Romans 9, 10, and 11. It has every right to be in the book of Romans. Don't try. Don't say it doesn't have that right. It's dealing with justification. It's dealing with faith. But it's dealing with a group of people that only stood Hebrew. So if anybody has any questions, statement of faith, or whatever, you're, this is what this is supposed to be. Don't be shy. Some people are telling me, don't won't say, say a word. You know what I mean? You know, I my wife is, I can tell you, she, she'll probably hear me by saying this. She's in North Carolina. But my wife loves to talk. And and I, and I says to her, she, loves, she answers a lot of questions for the people, too. She opened the door Sunday for me in our home. And we have uh, one of the men in our church speak. We have two men now can speak. So she likes to talk. And, I'll tell you how this is. And uh, she likes to talk when the news is on. <laughs> I watch the program. So I used to say, uh, 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 you know. And then one time I put cotton in my ears. I don't know why I thought of this, but I did. And then she tricked me with a question. I'm sitting there and, and I go, uh, I heard her talking about you. Uh, uh. And she goes, I didn't say anything. She just mumbled. She goes, What's, what are you doing? And I got, <laughs> cotton in my ears, you know what I mean? But. The reason why I said that is because I can't live without her, and I certainly can live with her. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me in the ministry was my wife. I don't know how many times Jim knows me, I wanted to quit. I, I can't tell you the amount of times I wanted to quit, but Nancy Leach, Leach made it happen for me. She sent me Richard's tape. I took Richard's course in 88 and started taking it, and I would go home, and my wife would be cooking, there would be... Our apartment was so cold, we had blankets. We had to go through the blankets and go through the doorway. She'd be cooking. And I said one time, I said, you know, I want to quit. I had enough of this. I'm walking through a blizzard to go to work. We have no money. And she goes, quiet. 
listen to these tapes. It was called Struggle for a Pure Church. Four men gave their testimonies, and boy, they just like, hey, that's us. You know, you know, you understand what I'm saying? We're a great church. We're small. Chicago's got some kind of people, but in comparison, in relationship to how many people in Chicago, it's not very much. But we hold the truth. We're a part of. You know how Paul was talking to the remnant here? We're a part of the remnant that, that's found in the age of grace. Who would have all men to be saved. That's lighthouse churches, Baptists, whatever one you want to say. Lighthouse churches all want men to be saved. But we're the ones, we're the elect within the elect that come to the knowledge of the truth. Who would have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. And we have. So if you have any questions, you know, you, you, you can preach if you want. I listen, you know. But do you understand the point I was trying to get across in there? Was it explained well enough for you to understand? Uh, I just wanted to give you the setting of Romans 9, 10, 11, and why would Paul use what he used there, and why would he say there's no difference? Why would he use Joel 2, 32? That was the big one yesterday. I didn't get out to quarter to seven until chapter 4 or 5. Does anybody know why Paul used that? Joel 2, 32? Because it doesn't violate the gospel of the grace of God. Israel set aside, nationally set aside, and Paul is free to use whatever he needs to use by God's grace, by God's inspiration, and use it. Okay? Well, I don't know what time we started. Uh, my friend has not come back in. So that's what I mean. If you have anything, yes, thank you. Go ahead. we got time. Uh, well, I just want to praise the Lord for clarity of the gospel and Amen. all the messages that we've heard Everyone. this week. Phenomenal, aren't they? Because, you know, we even have a family member that we have spoken to in the past. She's a Baptist who insists that just believing in the death of her own resurrection of Christ isn't enough. Wow. That you have to ask Jesus into your heart. And you have to ask him to forgive you. It, it just really nullifies uh, the lady that we gospel. stood with last night, Paula, uh, for a long time, she was crying. She ended up crying because a wow. man died in front of her, and she was only taught how to confess the Lord Jesus, and it was wrong doctrine, mm -hmm. and she condemned herself because she felt that she could have told him the right way of salvation. She was there at the accident, and I talk, tried to talk to her and said, look, you can't. It's like what Paul said. You can't condemn yourself for something like that. You don't know the crisis in that person's life. Sure, you have a heart. Sure, you're shedding tears. But we know the truth. Now the truth can set us free. It's only the beginning. I mean, this stuff like this interests me. Richard, are you guys all in Richard's church? Everybody goes to Richard's church here? No? No, me. Do you go to Richard's church? He's going to be doing Romans 9, 10, 11. But Richard has too much to do Romans 9, 10, 11. He's like, he did the book of Luke in seven years. Seven years. The crazy thing about it was, uh, what's the name was this here with the tape? I keep forgetting his name. Ed. Does it, Ohio? Ed. Ed. He listened to the whole course. He had the steering wheel put the course there with the videotape. Driving a tractor trailer. So Richard mentioned it on the last one because I did look with Richard. And uh, he mentioned it. He goes, I'll tell you something crazy since we had it. There's a guy out there driving a tractor trailer right now listening to our tapes. And it was that. And you know, it, it's just a, it's just an amazing thing that here, and in, in, I, I just enjoy being here with Richard. You know why? Because there's other preachers here. We have like faith. We can talk about things that are happening in our lives, uh, ministries, and teaching things like this is very interesting. Well, I, I'm done if you guys folks want to go, but if you want, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, we're internet watchers. What's that? I, we're internet watchers, so I do see short. Oh, okay. And Alex has been going through Romans and, and did. Is that wrong, Alex? That, okay. And he had explained that very close. I just have an offhand question. Or something sure, you absolutely. Made, you, mentioned yeah, that's where you, you made the comment that the tribulation was really three and a half years. Great tribulation, yes. The great tribulation. So are you just from, and when you... No, a tribulation, it's, there's seven years of Daniel's trouble. Right. Three and a half is a great tribulation. If you look at Leviticus 26, it's the fifth course of judgment. Okay. That's when it starts. The fifth course of judgment was ready to start when the Lord came. I'd like to show you something. If you, you don't want to talk, I'll talk. And you'll, you'll talk if you get me stopped. You don't want to get me going. Just want to show you something. Turn over to Matthew 6 and John 20. 
I just want to show you, I said something to you in the beginning, I just want to concur that with you. John 20 and uh, Matthew 16, Peter's keys. Uh, I never knew what Peter's keys were, did you? It was the gospel. So uh, this was a sure blessing when I came across it by studying it in Matthew 16. Whatever you do, don't get a, a Bible a lot of pages like I got. Uh, here, Matthew 16. When Peter was asked a question, and he says, uh, Peter, he says, he said unto them, verse 15, from Matthew 16, For whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the Messiah's message. That was concurred through the Acts period. And you know where it pops up again? Turn over to John 20. I'm going to show you something real quick. Like It's a blessing to me. Hopefully it's a blessing to you. Is that in concurrence with the John 3.16? Same, same. Very good. You see things start popping in your head? That's the whole point of a preacher. You, you, you know, a preacher's not supposed to know more than you. We're all supposed to be on equal basis. Amen. And as people study, there's things being said like he said, you said, and it helps us understand together. Every joint supplies. us. You ever hear that one? And it, You know, I've never put myself here. Paul taught me one thing in his apostleship. I had nine years of, of, of school, and the last three, I should have tossed the last six away because I, I took great school to Bible in 88. I started. <laughs> we are to reach the high ones and the low. We are to live here. Because we don't have all the answers. Nobody does. And if they do, just remember one thing. Like the book of Revelation, people proclaim to know it. A person says that to you, forget it. You don't just, know just it. move on. But look what he says in John 20, real quick. Verse 31. But these are written that we might believe. Now this is John speaking, the Apostle John. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. Is that our message? But why, why is it, uh, why can't his name save us? Turn over to Second John for a moment, real quickly. That's a Messiah message. That's a message to the nation of Israel. Those are Pete, Peter's keys. That's the gospel he was proclaiming, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he is the Christ. Th why, this, why do you think that would save them? What's that? Uh, the name. They didn't accept him as Messiah. The name. And it's, it's just the acceptance of the fact that he is the Messiah, yes. the promised one. Yes. That's well, the reason for it is when he came as the Messiah, that was prophesied, that he would save, if you read Matthew, yeah. Matthew 1 and 2, he would save their Israel from their sins. That was prophecy. Also, he was a prophet that would come, Deuteronomy 18, 18. He was a prophet to come. He was also an apostle. Never mentioned Hebrews 3, 1. He was an apostle and a prophet and a priest and a king. He was a shepherd. He was a bishop. He was, he was all these things to the nation of Israel. Never once was he your bishop. You know what a bishop is, don't you? Jimmy, you're an elder, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, you're a bishop. I'm an elder. I'm a bishop. Well, Christ was a bishop to the nation of Israel. He was the king. He was the great shepherd. He was an apostle, one sent to learn. Did he learn all what the Father wanted him to do? It says he's an apostle. High priest of our profession. He has all the terminologies. And through him, remember, he's before all things, by him all things consist. Without him being an apostle, there couldn't be no apostles. He's before all things, by him all things consist. Look at Second John for a moment. But, but before you go on, it's, yes, sir. it's the cross work that would save them. But in order to have that cross work applied to them, they had to believe that he was the Messiah. Right? Yes. Righteousness of God was all the way through the Old Testament. Right. Okay? The faith of it that's involved with, there's a message called repent, be baptized, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Right. There's only one. Do you know that there's only two words that change the world? Do you know what those two words were? I am. Good point. You know, I didn't think of that. Thank you. But now, change the course of life. You know why? What was happening now did not happen then. Right. What's happening now is not going to happen in the future. Paul's but now is so vital to dispensational truth. At the times of this ignorance, God commanded everywhere, but, but now to repent. It's, it's the faith that would save a person, God's yes. righteousness. And that's what Romans 10 is dealing with. The faith was displayed in different ways, just yes. as Abraham just believed that he would have a son. But we're not, we're not saved by Very believing well that we'll have a son. Yes. And when we come to the Gospels, he says, if you believe upon that I am the Christ. Yes. And that that's, faith, that's faith would say righteousness of faith goes from Genesis. You ever look at Genesis or Revelation? They were called two bookends. 
God has a library. A lot of people go to libraries, buy books. God put a library together where you didn't have to do all that. You know that, don't you? He put books with books so you could understand the breakdown of the Old Testament, the post and pre-exilic times, the four of books. And he put those books together so you could understand the, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. That's what he did. And people that say, they laugh at me and say, oh yeah, God's library. Well, what do you think it is? He wrote Romans 1 through 8 for Galatians. Because all the questions in Galatians weren't answered. So Paul says, you know what? I'll give you Romans. You'll understand it now. It's a history, it's a historic book of man since the beginning of time. And what the sin was, our brother did it so clearly this morning. Uh, I forgot his name there, the second one there. You might get saved. <laughs> uh, okay, real quick, like Second John and seven, we're quick. But there's more verses here in, in First Second John. Listen what he says: For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. If you want to take a little study, you write you write notes down. Go to Psalms chapter four, verse two. I don't have time. You can close that. We're done. Okay? I want to show you the word deceiver and what God did in